Hello there. Here I am with my Christopher Eccleston video, the 9th. Well, we now know he's actually really the 10th. Who knows how the numbering thing will be dealt with in future years. Uh, before I start, I should say, uh, that after my last exciting uh, Paul McGowan and Wilderness Years video, I actually had a message from YouTube on my page about the YouTube had gained sentience and uh, become a sort of Skynet of the internet and I uh, thought it would use this power to give me advice on my videos and it basically said that my videos would not be shit if they had some music and some on-screen captions and uh, some some banners telling you what was coming up later in the video and also some jokes about uh, I need some jokes uh, so knock knock Ah, uh, ah, uh, who's there? That's, that's what you should get. Doctor. Ah, ah, ah. Anyway, that's my joke. Uh, hoping uh, YouTube will now like my video because I do not want to fall foul of the evil internet overlords whose uh, rule I welcome when it kicks off. Uh, it's quite a benign way for the uh, sentient YouTube to start its evil dictatorship anyway, just offering slightly sarcastic opinions of my YouTube videos. I hope you like the quality wasn't what let YouTube achieve sentience. Uh, that would be depressing. So anyway, the, the ninth Doctor, I'm not bitter about that at all, am I? I may go on about that a bit more towards the end, but uh, the ninth Doctor, the return of the series after uh, officially a nine-year absence, but what was basically a 16-year absence, uh, it had a, a very difficult job to do. Uh, it's sort of easy now, looking back at it, to go, oh, it'd be easy to bring Doctor Who back. Uh, look how successful it would be. Anyone of any basic competence could have done it. But uh, it certainly didn't seem that way at the time. Uh, partly because, of course, one of the things we did talk about in the last video uh, was that during the wilderness years, BBC actually showed an awful lot of family science fiction action TV in the Doctor Who slot very successfully. Yeah, Superman, Bugs, Due South. Uh, Due South being a great example of the BBC shows the American Canadian series that was very successful for them on a Saturday. Then the BBC put money into making the show again after they got it cancelled. And as soon as it was a, at least partly a BBC show, they stuck it in an increasingly weird and unlikely number of time slots as if they were embarrassed by it. Uh, even Crime Traveller, uh, which is a show I quite enjoy, but it is utterly shit. Uh, not because of its utterly ludicrous portrayal of time travel. It's just the fact that it's a show about a British cop that is so poorly researched it has a normal British poli police officer carrying a gun. That's the least realistic thing in that entire show. Uh, and even that was getting, like, getting uh, between 11 and 9 million viewers a week. Uh, there was a market for a Doctor Who style show, and the BBC dealt with that by pretending that there wasn't. Uh, when Doctor Who came back so successfully, the uh, BBC was all like, oh, well, we would never have expected a Saturday afternoon family drama to do well. That, that stuff happened for years. What a surprise. Nobody mentioned Bugs. I don't worry, I don't think anybody actually remembers Bugs. And despite how successful it was at the time, I think we're going to get away with this is the conversation in BBC head offices. Uh, but of course, what, what Doctor Who had to do when it came back, there, there was a big public perception of what the show was like. It's slightly unfair. You know, Daleks can't go upstairs, wobbly sex, bad acting, sexism. And the new series did have to confront this head on pretty hard. I think you want to be good enough to just go, well, I think you're fine, but Daleks could go upstairs uh, for in 1988 on television and in the comics as far back as the 1960s. And how do you think they got about the decks for Marie Celeste, say? Eh? They could always fly, you fool! Uh, you had to bring all the, um, the especially older audience on side by confronting their perceptions of the show head on and saying, this isn't like that. Even if the original series was never really like that. And uh, one of the things, of course, ways it did that was in Cassie Eccleston. Uh, perceived 
as a very, very, very serious proper actor. Uh, I think mainly because of uh, his, you know, quite right, he doesn't like to do interviews and he's not a big press hound. And that has created, uh, again, an upset perception of him uh, being totally serious. Where even before Doctor Who, he was quite happy to do quite shitty action films I've got in 60 seconds. Uh, and of course, since then, anyone who's seen him in uh, G.I. Joe or sucking all the joy out of 4 2 will know that he's, he's not somebody who will only do high caliber classy work. Uh, but because he had that perception of being somebody who was the opposite of how I mean, perceived the Doctor Who would be, uh, let's remember that before the show came back, names we banded about included Paul Daniels. Uh, Pretty much any third-rate comedian. Other sort of pre eccleston Cassie suggestions. I think Alan Davis was the only remotely sensible one. Uh, I was sort of perceived as mainly because of how the 80s Doctors were viewed. As we had a part you would cast a slightly rubbish comedy actor at. Who, uh, so I remember when he was cast, uh, my family. Uh, who were sort of, uh, the old family was sort of, children of the 70s, uncles and aunts, who consider John Pertwee to be the best doctor, the, the fools, uh, but the, uh, after Tom Baker left, he went shit, the fools. Uh, they thought the idea of Doctor Who coming back was a bit rubbish, but as soon as Eccleston was cast, they were going, bloody hell, they've got an actual actor doing it. That's, I've got to watch that, that's, that's not what I would have expected, it's going to be a bit different, I think. Uh, so about those terms, this cast was an absolute masterstroke. Funny enough, almost immediately after that, they cast Billy Piper, who is exactly the perception of what a Doctor Who companion would be. That's what, yeah, as Rusty Davis himself has said, the papers were going, Billy Piper is going to be the new Doctor Who companion. Before they'd even thought of cast interviewing Billy Piper for the role. An ex-pop singer, that's a bit Bonnie Langford, isn't it? Uh, but of course, in that instance... Uh, well, we'll talk about Billy Piper later on, but it certainly works, uh, even if it did play to the hands of what critics would expect uh, the show to be like. Uh, so that's what I was saying to intent for Cassidy Eccleston. Not what you'd expect, very much a modern reinvention of the show, very much bringing it into the 21st century in the same way that the last days of Sylvester McCoy had been trying to bring it into the 1990s. Uh, sort of, so that was a big statement. Uh, Russell T. Davis, oddly enough, I'd never seen Queer as Folk, still haven't. Uh, but you sort of knew he was a big, proper TV name and a writer of stature of a show probably had it had since Douglas Adams had been working on it. And so that was quite exciting. I remember quite well there was two children's BBC shows, uh, Century Falls and uh, Dark Seasons, uh, the later of which, that was f fucking mental. Uh, I've never actually tracked that down on DVD because I suspect it can't possibly live up to expectations. But of course, that was one of the last things he'd ever done for the BBC. Uh, I, I remember correctly from reading TV Zone at the time, he wasn't happy with how that show was treated and he sort of made the decision not to work for the BBC again. Uh, in fact, a large part bringing Doctor Who back had nothing to do with the fact that BBC, well, there certain elements of BBC didn't want to make Doctor Who, they weren't that bothered about it, but they did want to work with Russell T. Davis. So if well, yeah, we'll do his Doctor Who vanity project. Then we'll get him to write something good for us. As ludicrous as that sounds, that uh, many of the people involved uh, they've talked about uh, BBC Wales were very up from doing Doctor Who and prove themselves. Any time any of the writers had to go to London for a meeting, they would be treated by credulity uh, by anybody they met at television centre. You know, doing Doctor Who? Are you insane? Are you off your tits? Uh, so in many ways we're certainly lucky that it didn't go to Wales uh, where there was a keen and eager group of people uh, desperate to you know, make good television that wasn't aimed solely at the Welsh which was, must surely be a soul-destroying exercise uh, to be involved in. So you had a good, well-regarded head writer you had a production team that were keen to do it you had a lead actor who was keen to do something different. In many ways, he's a bit of a uh, William Hartnell. Uh, I think he wanted to do it because he wanted to escape his typecasting as a serious, 
Grim Actor, which is ironic because his Doctor is basically regarded as a serious Grim one. Uh, again, he's not really that. Uh, and he's had... Well, of course, that's the thing with Eccleston is that of all the Doctors, he is most defined by the controversy behind the scenes. You know, Colin Baker had two years of role. Things may have gone wrong, but at least he was the Doctor for a while before things went off the rails. Paul McGann only did one episode, but there was no immediate replacement for him. You know, if, if you'd asked anybody in December 1996 who the new current Doctor he was, they'd have said Paul McGann. Uh, and he was sort of stuck in that limbo state for several years after that, even after the movie had faded from most people's consciousness. Eccleston, his departure was announced after just one episode. You knew he was going, there was only somebody new in. Uh, you, know, you knew it wasn't going to end with his departure because of a few fingers, four rows. Uh, and Tennant's casting was announced fairly early on in this season. He had weeks as the current Doctor. And it all became arguments and debates about why he left. And the BBC put it out a fake press statement. Uh, it perfectly, as is really his right, he's not talked about that ever since, uh, nor... Has anybody else? I can't imagine Russell D. Davis will ever spill the beans. I think the only person whose name often comes up who might do an interview at some point in the future would be uh, the director of the early episodes, Keith Boak. If only so, he could go all those stories about it being my fault are false. Uh, I mean, all this stuff going on pretty much distracts all attention away from his performance and. Uh, and the version of the character. And, you know, Eccleston apparently is perfectly polite when he meets Doctor Who fans in the street. You know, he can get a bit shirty with interviewers, but that's because he's been asked the same question about Doctor Who every day for the last ten years. Uh, it's, uh, at some point, he must have thought along the lines, maybe I should just do a tell-all interview and get them to shut up, or maybe I should do Day of the Doctor, even though I don't really want to, just because that would be another ten years of questions of why didn't you do Day of the Doctor? Uh, so that he stuck to his guns, I think, is fairly commendable there. Uh, let's say true to himself, despite what we see some fairly annoying pressure from outside sources. Uh, but uh, it's uh, a very strange era. It was very strange at the time. Yeah, the excitement was back. It was a hit. He's going, the viewing figures are taking off quite badly as the season goes on. And despite their heavy promotion... Of the final two parts, uh, and the, you know, uh, Chris Wilson's last episode was watched by less people who saw Time Lash. Uh, no, of course, he has the advantage of it. Modern episodes are constantly being repeated, so I think by this stage, far, far more people have seen that than ever saw any poor old Colin Baker episode. Uh, it's a sort of strange, of course, a fan self disruptive gene. You don't expect it to be a hit. As soon as he comes back and things start going wrong behind the scenes, he thinks he's going to go tits up pretty much instantly. It won't get a second year, and of course it did. Uh, I think there may have been rumours that they recorded another ending to Eccleston's last episode without a regeneration. I don't know how true that is. Uh, certainly David Tennant didn't record his half of it. Uh, I don't, in fact, I don't believe he was even cast and formally until after the Eccleston episodes had started going out, so they were certainly had some hedging of bets, they might have had a plan B of what to do with a regeneration if they didn't get another year, if it hadn't worked. Uh, but it was a hit, and uh, Eccleston is often overlooked with all this discussion and debate about uh, what was going on in his head at the time, and, you know, he was key to its success. Uh, first thing to say is that despite what people say, his doctor isn't serious, dour and drab, and got constantly going on about how he saw his old bird with a furrowed brow. If he's quite a silly doctor in many ways. Uh, some of silliness is slightly outside his comfort zone. He gets better as he goes along. Uh, some of the oh, stuff in, uh, especially if Keith Boak directed episodes that they did first, he's slightly unsure of how to do. But uh, of course, he's in a season where everybody is slightly unsure of what to do. This year is unlike any other year of the Doctor Who revival. Uh, 
So it's sort of like the first season of Star Trek Next Generation. Yeah, it's a better season of television than the first season of Star Trek Next Generation is. But there you had a whole bunch of people not sure what they were doing in terms of making Star Trek, making mistakes, doing things they wouldn't do again. And even though it's a very uneven season of Star Trek, it's actually quite an interesting one to watch. And again, you know, there are much better episodes of Doctor Who in this first season of the new Doctor Who, but it's not as assured and as confident as even the second season is. Uh, but there's some interesting stuff, you know. They wouldn't do the far team really be now. And but anyway, that's something that makes it all the fans go... Ooh. Ooh. It's not three seconds of screen time, and it would have made a toddler laugh. It's, you've really got to have a sense of perspective on that. It's not an episode really thing. Uh, the, the Slovene two-parter, the farting aliens. There's a lot, the problem is it's trying to be uh, subversive and funny and send up alien invasion stories. But the problem is, the co a Doctor Who hadn't done a proper big-scale present-day alien invasion story at that point. So it was more dependent on people remembering either old Doctor Who or other films or TV shows for it to work. It's not, you really needed a standard, well-done Doctor Who alien invasion story for the human to, for subversion to work uh, properly. And also a lot of the comedy is just not very funny. Ah, fat people! Uh, funny fat people is a recurring theme in the Russell T Davies era. Uh, forget the so-called gay agenda, the fat people are funny agenda is far more prevalent. And it's, uh, that, it's worse than that story. And again, nobody really knows how to play if they overdo it. Uh, only enough, it's one of the best Harriet Jones story. Uh, she's far more overdone in her later appearances and maybe she just seems more nuanced surrounded by the comedy fat people going I'm shaking my booting uh, it's, it's, it's quite fun though to know that just about the first thing filmed for the new series of Doctor Who involved a comedy space pig I love that uh, that scene is brilliant uh, in terms of it, the first episode of went out of course Rose it's a pretty solid first... It, it, it's easy, people tend to be very down on Rose now. It's not as good as what came later. It would be slightly embarrassing if your very first episode wasn't improved upon by almost everything that came later. And it does what it needs to do. It's fun. You can see, again, the unevenness of tone. Uh, the plastic Mickey stuff is horrendous. And I think uh, at the time, Russell C. Davis defended that by saying... Well, she's not going to assume he's been replaced by a plastic robot, is she? Nobody would do that. But it doesn't work because the makeup on him makes him look like a plastic robot. And she just looks like an idiot for not realising that. Uh, especially as it makes him to spend hours together uh, just driving about. But the real success of it is Billy Piper. And, you know, they talk about ground in the series. And to be honest, I recorded this on a Billy Piper-style council estate. So I can say with fairly certainty that it's a picture of casual estate life is as completely as unrealistic as anything to do with Ace in the McCoy era. It has no basis of reality of being a teenager, working class teenager in the mid-2000s. It's a middle-aged posh Welsh guy's idea of what the London work cockneys are like. Uh, but... She's still a well-written, likeable character, and Billy Piper is brilliant. Uh, especially in this first season, uh, Rose will become drastically more annoying and unlikable as the series and her returns go on. But here, she feels like a, uh, a really likeable character, funny, uh, smart, uh, very proactive, uh, often at the expense of a doctor. But whilst Christopher Eccleston is struggling with tried a different sort of uh, character to which he usually does uh, she can hit the ground running and does genuinely feel like the actual lead of the show and you know people complain like, why do they make such a fuss of Rose uh, why do they keep bringing her back why is she seen as so as important as the Doctor which is something people say about Clara now as well like, you know, it's because it's a TV show that has two lead characters there is no excuse for them both not being as important as each other. Uh, I think the Doctor suffers in terms of the overall series, in terms of uh, his proactiveness, but certainly not in relation to how Rose is portrayed. 
and she is the out and out star of that season. Um, Mickey and Jackie start off quite poorly again um, because they're not sure how to play it, but they do improve as the season goes along. And uh, Noel Clark is a bit of an unsung hero by the end of his time on the show, often making slightly odd writing decisions uh, work far better than they have any rights. Uh, in fact, he's even apologised his performance in those early episodes uh, because he feels he didn't get it right because of having come straight off a plane from our free design pet and uh, being upset over the death of one of the cast members of that show. Uh, he, th he thinks that affected his performance there. So, you know, full fair play to him there. He certainly turned it around as the show went on. Uh, and then, sort of, the rest of the season, in a long way, it's about setting out the rules of what New Doctor Who is. So, you get one in the past, the young quite dead, I quite like. Uh, there's a weird Lawrence uh, Miles uh, thing where he had a go of supposed racism of saying uh, these aliens coming over here and turn out to be evil immigrants. Uh, but, uh, well, I'd say that's a valid re reading of the episode if you want. Equally, if you. That's a reading you can make out of so, so ma many Doctor Who stories. If you're going to read Evil Aliens as a view of foreigners coming over here, basically Doctor Who is one of the most racist TV programmes ever made. And you shouldn't really be watching it if uh, you're going to take that viewpoint. Uh, myself, I think this is quite a fun light episode. And uh, what Mark Gattis does get enough credit for is that he uh, established the celebrity historical templates that... The Queen Victoria episode, the Shakespeare episode, the Christie episode. Uh, Stephen Moffat's done it a bit less, actually, thankfully. Uh, but all Hughes. Uh, though, oddly enough, uh, Mark Gattis himself played with it a bit and did it just to a dry me when he did the Churchill episode. Uh, so that's quite fun. End of the World. Uh, a pretty solid episode. He's got some nice gags. Uh, problem is, with me, uh, as becomes a recurring thing, with Russell T. Davis, the uh, satire of plastic surgery is so incredibly on the nose, there's no subtlety there. Uh, uh, but there is, across all these early episodes, there is one big recurrent problem, and that is the Doctor doesn't do a lot to resolve the crisis. And, uh, sort of, it, it's what would happen with some sort of remark, where you can't just point at one episode and go, it's a fault of this episode. It's an accumulative effect. You know, the first one, Rose, saves the day with her gymnastics. Fair enough. She's a new character. Uh, the new regular, she has to justify going in the TARDIS. Uh, end of the world. Uh, the day is saved by the tree woman holding down that lever in the crap fan sequence. Uh, the Unquiet Dead. Rose and the Doctor are cowering in a corner when Charles Dickens saves a day. The alien of London two-parter, Mickey saves a day with his passwords, whilst uh, Doctor Who is hiding in a bunker that's about to get bombed. Uh, uh, then you get a few episodes where it's not as bad. Then you get uh, the long game where a guest star whose name I can't even remember Saves a day while the Doctor and Rose are chained up in front of Simon Pegg. Uh, the worst that one for that is his final two. And I know, well, we now know, that the series was conceived of if it was going to be a second year. Of course, Chris Rackleson was going to be in it. So maybe uh, when RTD was working out the plot beats, he didn't think it was going to be his last episode. There should have been a bit more rewriting. Because then in Chris Rackleson's last episode, all he really does is sit around building a doomsday machine that he then decides not to use. It's Captain Jack down in the bounds of the station and Rose back in the present day. They're the ones driving the plot. Uh, it, the, Doctor is, the Ninth Doctor is embarrassingly irrelevant to his last episode of television. And that is such a shame, especially as it's uh, unlikely uh, at the moment at least that we will ever see him in the role again. Uh, but the other episodes, of course... Dalek is the first one where everything fires on all cylinders. Other than one slightly overdone scene on the staircase, where it just doesn't, the direction doesn't work there because it looks like the Dalek can just shoot them from the bottom of the stairs. It doesn't make any sense why they are just standing there in the uh, shooting range of it, mocking it. 
I have, a, I have a bloke from Corrie, he's a bit rubbish. But that is, if that is Chris Reckleson's best performance, uh, he just rips the scene apart. Uh, I attended a talk where Robert Sherman talked about how he hadn't written the scene with it being played like that in mind. He thought the scene would be like it was the original big finished story Jubilee, where Colin Baker plays it in a sort of uh, traditionally doctorish way. The shouting, the spit, the anger, all of that was Eccleston and uh, Joe uh, Hearn, the director. And it's just brilliant. And the Dalek is fantastic. It's just such a shame so much of the good work of that episode in making the Daleks badass motherfuckers has been undone by them being almost constantly a bit crap in all their, well, virtually all of their subsequent new series appearances. Uh, there's so much stuff there. Stuff that didn't really get used after season one as well, like the force field and the, uh, the 360 degree pivot. It was, uh, it's just so well done, so well realised. Uh, I don't know why Joe O'Hearn hasn't directed any episodes in the decade since then. Uh, certainly, you know, he's not one of the people anybody seems to have any issues with behind the scenes. I guess he just uh, either isn't interested, because it, it'd be unlikely that he hasn't been available at all uh, for any of the dates since then. Uh, so presumably he just uh, doesn't want to do Doctor Who again, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, which will make, of course, fairly almost people, uh, the rumour that Chris Reckleson supposedly said he would only do Day of the Doctor if Joe O'Hearn directed it. And of course, people go, well, Stephen Moffat should have got Joe O'Hearn to do it. He should have done that. Uh, without even just thinking about Joe O'Hearn's wishes in the matter, whether he would want to do it. No, he will do it, because we demand that Chris Reckleson be with special whether you want to direct it or not. Uh, fans can be dicks sometimes. Uh, Father's Day, Paul Cornell episode. Again, very good. I get uh, the shame that uh, Blood Rob Shame with Paul, Paul Cornell hasn't done more. Uh, after Human Nature, uh, I, I could be quite happy to have one episode a year. Paul Cornell, he really does it well. And yes, he's a bit of a cliche type paradox episode. But of course, it's the first time the new series has sort of touched on that stuff. Uh, and it, the logic doesn't make any sense. But it's just so beautifully written. And uh, Billy Piper, again, carries out the entire episode fantastically. Uh, uh, of course, the big one is a Moffat two parter. Uh, which is the best story of the season. Uh, so well written, so well done. And it's so unlike a Stephen Moffat script. There is no type paradox stuff. Uh, no f stuff with Doctor flirting with women. Uh, it's just a straightforward sci-fi action thriller. Where it owes a lot, a horror thriller as well, uh, I should say. It owes a lot. Uh, oddly enough, does it really get talked about to the Star Trek pilot for Cage? All the stuff about the alien uh, not understanding humans and rebuilding them wrong is from that Star Trek pilot, as are, of course, the uh, nanogenes, whatever they call the uh, nanites, so it wouldn't sound like something ripped off from Star Trek. Uh, Captain Jack is great about that. that is, uh, people have said this before, but Stephen Moffat writes Captain Jack better than anybody else, so it's just kind of a shame that was the only time he ever wrote Captain Jack. Uh, Boomtown, it's okay. The following Boomtown is that it's an episode that sets up a potentially interesting moral dilemma about what you do if you capture the monster. Uh, and then it doesn't see it through. You know, do they take it to like, have the death penalty or not? Can Do you execute genocidal maniacs? Personally, I'm, even though I'm generally against the death penalty, I would say someone who tries the genocide of the entire human race, if you think you execute them. That's fair enough. Uh, but yeah, it presents this debate and then it totally chickens out on any sort of solution by turning it into an egg by opening up the TARDIS. Uh, even sort of saying, if it had come out and said there are no easy answers to this, this is a difficult question that everybody has different opinions on, we can't just give you an answer, you have to make up your own personal mind. That would have been a good ending. Uh, or good uh, conclusion to the issue, uh, the, the ethical debate. But that may actually come up, up, comes up with, goes, oh, here's a difficult question, let's not come up with any statements on it, let's have a really cheesy happy ending. Ugh. A bit painful. Uh, um, the final, then, uh, well, of course, you know, the end of Boomtown gives away the Daleks going to be in part two. 
Uh, but obviously we just get, we, I mean, failed to do a secret regeneration, we just thought, fuck it, we'll just say, yeah, Daleks, lots and lots of Daleks. Uh, now, of course, I, I think we, had pretty much anyone with any sense would have worked out the Daleks were going to be back, and that if you hadn't, about halfway through part, uh, Bad Wolf, you, you will have worked out that they will be in it. So that's not so much an issue itself, it's the fact that part one of that story very, very carefully builds up to a reveal of the Daleks. You know, Joe Hearn's direction is fantastic there. There's little bits and pieces and hints and slowly escalating their present, visual presence in the episode up till the point where you get money shot, thousands of Daleks flying about, thousands of Dalek ships. That beautiful final moment space, unlike anything Doctor Who had ever done before, completely ruined by the a trailer at the end of Boomtown. Um, pointlessly as well, because view, it had no effect on viewing figures giving it away. Uh, that sort of colours your perception of part one, because you see me thinking, come on, where are the fucking Daleks? And it's again, it's sort of this television satire. Uh, quite, and you sort of, as you watch it, as it happens a lot with a lot of celebrity cameos again from the Davis era, but no more so than in this episode, a lot of it is dated hideously badly. Uh, Weakest Link, Trinity and Susanna, uh, a lot of the TV gags. Uh, it's slightly odd Big Brother is still on and relevant. I don't think anyone would have guessed that. But other than that, it's just slightly unfunny and slightly painful. Uh, other, up to the point where Rose seemingly gets killed, and then I love the fact we're in the Doctor's Arrest scene, they take the sort of screwdriver off him. Uh, first time ever anybody's ever done that. Well done. And this way, the Doctor's no nonsense, let's fuck up this place for killing Rose attitude after that, is fantastic. And the last ten minutes of an episode is brilliant. And despite the Doctor's irrelevance to part two, part, that really just hits ground running and is very bleak, unrelentedly so. The Daleks going around masquerading everybody, uh, including the seemingly nice character you expect to live. And uh, that shot of it outside the window uh, in space with the silent exterminate and his eyes flashing. That's brilliantly done. Uh, so, you know, outside of the first week, uh, a week first half, the second half is pretty good. And I even don't mind the opening of the TARDIS bit and the gold, gold ejaculation blowing up all the Daleks. Over the fact, it's a bit none of the Time Lords thought of doing that during the war. Oh, if I do this thing, I would have to regenerate, will I, Rat? But I would kill all the Daleks? That's probably worth doing, isn't it? Let's all open up our TARDIS consoles. I'm sure we can find a truck from somewhere while it's open. Uh, but it's, yeah, it works. It's got a nice operatic quality to it. Uh, essentially, uh, as the Christmas Invasion afterwards did establish that they can't do that again as well. That helps. Uh, with one word, why don't we just do that every week? But uh, it's uh, it, it works, and it's uh, the regeneration itself is very nicely done. I mean, uh, yeah, you could argue the appeal of the classic series generations is maybe more different. Uh, it's a shame that it's become more standardised now. But equally, when it's the same people doing the series and working on the regenerations, I'm not sure how once they've come up with a way, with a way of doing it well, they're going to come up with. Uh, should come up with a completely different way, uh, working against her instincts. So that doesn't bother me too much. And yeah, Beckelson does very nicely in his last scene as well. Uh, again, playing a bit of humour in there, and uh, it's a good, that, not a good last episode for him, but a good last scene. And uh, overall, season one. As you would expect from a show now ten years old, maybe you didn't really know what they were doing to start with, it has aged surprisingly badly. Uh, the direction is it as cinematic as you get in Doctor Who now, or in a lot of TV shows now. Uh, the pacing is surprisingly sluggish compared to the new series, uh, uh, to the more recent episodes. Uh, so many of the CGI effects poor, the slimming especially, when we come between them with the costumes. I mean, you know, that's just what happens when something gets, starts getting a bit old, as it is now. Uh, 
Certainly, uh, the episodes of Ronald Moment will look as equally dated in ten years' time, I've no doubt. Uh, certainly, it's a less even season than the second season is. You know, a lot of people say, but you should start with Christmas Invasion when you start with New Who and the Skip Eccleston entirely, which I would say is unfair, because the best of our first year is up now with the best of Doctor Who, both before and since. And uh, even when it's making mistakes, it's making interesting mistakes. And, uh, yeah, the long game is probably the worst episode of that season. And all it is is a bit dull and forgettable. Uh, certainly in terms of consist consistently, I think only David Tennant's first year actually beats it. Uh, over Russell T. Davis' run. Uh, so, you know, forget everything that happened when he left. Forget the behind the scenes stuff. Go watch Crystal Jackson era as you know, a new doctor, a new start. An actor doing his best and at times being brilliant, even if he's overshadowed by his guest star. Uh, I, I suppose I should wrap up with another one of my jokes to keep YouTube happy. So have you ever thought about how Eccleston, Eccles, 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 what his favourite cake is? Uh, I imagine that Christopher Eccleston's favourite cake is the Eccles cake. Hey, that's a new YouTube. I hope you're happy. I hope that brings you some joy. And uh, my next Doctor Who video will of course be looking at the uh, most successful of the new series Doctors uh, to date. Uh, David Tennant, uh, the one who really grabbed the show by the balls and uh, took the work that Eccleston had done uh, to make it a success and ramped it up to the next level. So uh, join me for that. There will be more jokes, but uh, no music. Probably no one's from captions. Uh, I could go out on a song, but I'm not going to. Be seedy.